So I have to uh, add on to what I said this morning. So in 2017, Pavel's first appearance here uh, at our first conference, and he uh, did, uh, it was Tatneft, right? Yes, Tatneft, correct. It was like 90% 90, 90 up. So that was the best idea so far in the entire uh, conference history. So uh, let's see if you can uh, beat, uh, beat that one. Uh, so pay attention, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I'd like to tell you about uh, one of our favorite investment ideas. Uh, before I do so, uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, 3G Capital. Uh, some disclosures, or the, this is the fun part. So uh, here is some information about uh, 3G Capital. Uh, 3G Capital is a private investment partnership that seeks to invest in undervalued businesses around the world. Uh, our investment universe includes Frontier, Emergent, and develop markets. We seek to invest at single digit multiples in a small collection of industry leading businesses. More specifically, we focus on investing in businesses that occupy number one and number two positions in their respective industries and uh, generate returns on equity of at least 15 to 20% while employing little or no debt. We'd like to stick with industries that exhibit something that we call uh, a pattern of leadership sustainability, such that the number one and number twos in those industries tend to stay in the lead for decades. Our uh, target valuation is anywhere from four to 10 times normalized earnings. Uh, as a practical matter, if you look at our portfolio today, uh, the price earnings ratio for the entire portfolio is about five and a half times with a corresponding dividend yield of about 7%. Finally, we practice a concentrated approach to uh, portfolio management. Our top five positions generally comprise uh, about 60 to 70% of the total. We've been in business for uh, almost over 15 years, and in the course of our existence, we uh, produced a track record of significant out performance versus the benchmark. As you can see here, uh, since inception, we outperformed the benchmark by uh, about three and a half percent. And then uh, since we started going global, we outperformed the benchmark by an even more significant amount. And just uh, a word of clarification here, uh, our investment approach has always been the same since day one, i.e. looking for good businesses available at good prices. However, prior to 2000 to 2008, 2009, our investment universe was restricted to US only. and. Uh, Around 2008, 2009, we expanded our investment universe to include uh, non-US developed markets, also uh, emerging and frontier markets. And as you can tell, our uh, outperformance has increased uh, dramatically since, that, uh, since we made that, uh, that change. Uh, now, before I go into uh, the idea discussion, I'd like to uh, uh, review the past uh, ideas that I presented here. Uh, I think that's a good exercise just to sort of uh, this way you can see whether you should even listen to the rest of my presentation. So in 2017, I presented Tatnaft, and uh, Tatnaft is a regional integrated oil and gas company out of uh, Tatarstan, Russia. Uh, the company is the most profitable uh, oil and gas major in the public space uh, due to its unique low-cost advantage that cannot be replicated by the competitors. Uh, at the time of the presentation, Tatnaft was selling uh, for about uh, five times earnings, and it had a dividend yield of about uh, 13%. Uh, within a year of the presentation, uh, the stock price increased about 90%, and uh, around with that time, we disposed of our position because we found uh, a more attractive investment opportunity. The second idea presented here at IVIC was last year. Uh, it was a company called uh, Foxton's. Uh, Foxton's Group PLC, and Foxton's, by way of background, is uh, the largest real estate agency in London, UK. Uh, they have a unique single brand, highly centralized business model, such that uh, they're a lot more efficient and provide uh, much better customer service compared to the competition. And uh, at the time of the presentation, it was selling uh, at a mid-single digit multiple of earnings, of normalized earnings. And uh, since the time of the presentation, uh, the stock price increased about uh, 45%. 
and uh, we still hold the position. So now I'd like to discuss our investment idea. And the investment idea is a company called Ulker Biscuvi. Uh, Ulker is the largest confectionery manufacturer in Turkey. Ulker uh, markets, uh, produces markets, and distributes biscuits, chocolate, cookies, crackers, uh, chewing gum uh, under the company's own brand names. The company's brand names occupy leading positions in Turkey, but also across Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. The company is fairly uh, well diversified geographically with international operations contributing about 40% uh, of EBIT. The company was founded uh, back in 1944 by the Ulker family, and uh, the family is today still very much involved in the business. Uh, they still own the controlling stake, and uh, they're involved with day-to-day uh, -day operations. Uh, the business, as you can probably tell based on this little snippet, is a very attractive business in terms of quality, uh, and uh, it is also currently available at a very attractive price, and the price is uh, uh, roughly 7.8 times earnings. Now, I know that uh, most value investors, they follow Buffett's advice of looking for uh, wonderful businesses at uh, fair prices. I think uh, if your investment uh, universe is uh, big enough, you can do better than that. You can, you can actually find wonderful companies at wonderful prices, and uh, that's exactly what, what you get with, uh, with Ulker. So now uh, I'd like to go over the three critical elements of the investment case, namely business, management, and price. So first off, let's uh, examine business. Is Ulker Biscuvi a good business? Well, anytime you talk about business quality, it always necessarily starts with a strong competitive advantage. So if you look at Ulker, that's exactly what you get. If you look at uh, the market position for the company's brands, you will see that they occupy leading positions in their respective markets. The company is number one in Turkey, they're number one in Saudi Arabia, they're number two in Egypt, and they're, they're number three in Kazakhstan. Uh, the company's main competitive advantages are the brand power, distribution, and scale. So with brand power, you're able to charge a premium versus the competition. And uh, with distribution at scale, you're able to make the product available to consumers on a per unit cost that is lower than that of the competition. And as a result of that, you earn industry leading margins, which for Ulker are around 14 to 15%. It would be tough for a potential uh, market entrant to replicate the company's competitive advantages. Uh, it would probably cost a potential entrant about two and a half to three billion dollars to replicate those advantages that I just talked about. And uh, most companies in the industry don't even have that kind of resource. If you look at the confectionery industry on a global basis, you're probably gonna see three or four companies that do have that kind of money, but uh, they know well enough that the cost of entry on a greenfield basis in such, into such a market would far exceed any money that you would expect to make as a result of such market entry. So not surprising that uh, given the fact that you have uh, such a strong competitive advantage, you generate uh, very good returns on equity while employing uh, minimal debt. More specifically, uh, Ulka earns about 25% return on equity. And uh, even though they have debt payback of uh, about one and a half years, so uh, meaning if the company wanted to uh, pay out its debt completely, they could do it in about a year and a half. Now, we'll, what we like to do anytime we look at a business, we like to see if uh, there is something that we call leadership sustainability present within those industries. So specifically when it comes to confectionery industry, if you look at the history of the industry going back 200 years, you actually find remarkable competitive sustainability. You look at the leading players in the space, uh, like Nestle, Cadbury, Marsh, Lind, uh, Wrigley, et cetera, et cetera, what you see that they remain in the lead not for decades, but for centuries. So there is a very good chance that for Ulker, given the fact that they're the leader today, 
they will probably stay in the for the decades to come. And therefore, as a shareholder, you're gonna keep enjoying this uh, impressive profitability. Uh, now, Olker is gonna do better than just maintaining the status quo with respect to its competitive position. Uh, if you examine the past 10 years for Ulker, what you see is that the company has grown underlying business value. Uh, you can look at uh, revenues, they've grown revenues about 6%, and they've grown uh, profitabil uh, the profits at about 10%, and uh, I'm talking US dollar terms here, not Turkish lira. Uh, and I think going forward, you're probably gonna see a very similar dynamic. The company should be able to use its competitive advantages to grow the underlying business value as the company consolidates its position in existing markets and also enters new ones. So that concludes this discussion of the business. Uh, now I'd like to discuss uh, management quality of Ulker. So typically I look at three things when it comes to management quality. The first thing I like to look at is operator skills. So are managers good operators? Then I like to look at capital allocator skills and I like to see proper incentives in place. So let's look at uh, operator skills first. So uh, I give them an A grade for their operator skills. And uh, if you look at the history of the company, prior to 2011, the business was also a good one at the core, but there were a lot of non-core stuff that was not very good. The company was uh, mismanaged and the family installed a new management team back in 2011. So as a result of that, uh, the new management team said, okay, let's embark on an ambitious business improvement pro uh, project. So what they started doing, they said, okay, we're gonna put our resource behind our best and biggest brands, we're gonna rationalize SKUs, and we're gonna consolidate the distribution and supply arrangements. The company also disposed of uh, all the non-core assets, and uh, they also de-emphasized private label and secondary brands that were dragon profitability. So as a result of those actions, the market position for Olker improved substantially, and so did the profitability. If you look at uh, the financial numbers, what you'd see is that EBIT margins for Ulker increased from 46% prior to the business improvement plan being put in place uh, from to about 12 to 14% today. And uh, similarly, if you look at the returns on equity, uh, prior to the business improvement project, they were about uh, 12 to 14% prior to 2011. Well, today, they're generating returns on equity close to 25%. And that's despite the fact that the company uh, went through a meaningful debt reduction program. Looking at the capital allocator skill of Ulker management team, I also give them an A grade. If you look at uh, their track record, you'd see that they allocate capital into the profitable investment opportunities while returning a portion of cash flow to the shareholders in the form of a dividend. Uh, historically, those investment opportunities were both organic and acquired, and they always served to either reinforce the company's competitive position in existing markets, or open up new growth avenues. And uh, generally, I'm kind of skeptical about companies that do acquisitions. A lot of times, managers tend to either overpay for acquisitions, or they buy non-core assets that actually uh, create more of a nuisance for the business, but in case of Ulker, their track record when it comes to acquisitions is, is very solid. If you look at the company's profitabilities post-acquisitions, you, you see that actually improved, which tells you that uh, uh, the company managed to do deals that were good, both with respect to uh, the quality of the businesses they acquired, but also with respect to the price that they paid. And of course, uh, management of Ulker managed to uh, maintain a very conservative balance sheet. Uh, and uh, finally, on the incentives front, uh, the Ulker family still owns 60% of, uh, of the company, so uh, their interests are aligned with those of the shareholders. And finally, the third critical element of our investment case, uh, the price. So currently the company is available for about 7.8 times earnings and a dividend yield of about 5%. 
Uh, to put this valuation in perspective, you can uh, uh, look at history. So over the past 10 years, Ulker would normally trade around 20 times earnings. And if you look at the company's peers around the world, from Pakistan to Bangladesh to Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera, you, you see that on average they traded about uh, 25 times earnings owing to the quality of those confectionery businesses. A couple of risks that we should discuss. Uh, as a US dollar-based investor, we uh, face currency risk. However, what the company does, they sell low-ticket items in highly dollarized economies. So historically, they've had no issue passing negative FX impact onto the end user. And therefore, even though over the short term, you might face local currency depreciation, over the long term, the uh, uh, impact of uh, local currency depreciation has not been material at all. Uh, the second risk that you face is capital management risk. Uh, the company uh, is controlled by a hold call, uh, which is an investment vehicle for the Alcor family, and uh, they have a degree of control over distribution and the capital allocation. So generally what I do to see if those policies have been friendly, I look at the track record and see if historically the family treated uh, minority shareholders of Ulker uh, in a uh, fair manner, and indeed it has been the case. Uh, if you look at uh, the profitability of Ulker, it's actually in line with the company's global peers, which tells you that uh, they've been monetizing uh, the economics to the full extent. Uh, so the minority shareholders have been treated uh, fairly. Uh, finally, to sum up, so with Ulker, you get a leading confectionery company with an impressive long-term track record of growth and profitability. The company operates in an industry that exhibits a remar remarkable leadership sustainability pattern, which means that Ulker's trajectory of success is likely to continue going forward. You have a management team that is willing to share the lucrative economics of the business with the shareholders, yet the price for the business is so attractive as if you were looking at a low quality cigar butt. Uh, some risks do exist, but they're more than absorbed by the enormous margin of safety. So even if those, some of those risks do come to pass, we should do well as the shareholders. And uh, if they don't, uh, we should uh, knock the cover off the bowl. So that concludes my presentation. And uh, now I'm happy to take whatever questions you might have. Pavel, great presentation. Thank um, you. Just uh, you showed this historical multiple range, and it's trading at well below historical PE multiples. I'm just right. wondering if you can comment on why do you think the current multiple is so much lower than where the company historically traded? Uh, well, I think uh, if you uh, follow the headlines related to Turkey, you see that uh, there's been a lot of uh, geopolitical strife in that part of the world. So I think that uh, depresses asset prices, uh, and people probably say, well, you know what? Who knows what happens here with Turkey, and uh, therefore the multiple gets depressed. So, but, but then again, uh, like I said, if you look at uh, the company's peers around the world, in Nigeria and Bangladesh or Pakistan, uh, they sell at a much, much higher multiple. So in terms of uh, general risk profile, I, I just don't think uh, Turkey is gonna be that much worse than Bangladesh or Rwanda or Nigeria. Any other questions? Yep. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the uh, holding that Zeal is holding, I suppose. Yes. Why do they keep it uh, public, the Ilker Biscovi part? And uh, second question, is it uh, on what stock market does it note? Uh, it's uh, trading in uh, Istanbul. Mm. And the reason they keep it public, I suppose, because it uh, provides for greater transparency and visibility and it basically forces the, managers of the, forces the discipline on the managers of the company to demonstrate that uh, their profitability is in line with those of the peers. But the management is the family. Well, the management is not family, so the family controls the whole thing, but uh, they pick out a professional management team. So people who are the managers, like the CEO of Olker is not part of the family. 
Any other questions? Hi, thanks for your presentation, it was very nice. Uh, how do you hedge your currency exposure in this kind of uh, countries where volatility uh, has so uh, a steep uh, increase lately? Uh, sure, so uh, when it comes to hedging currency, uh, we never use forwards or futures, so that would be an explicit hedge, we don't really do it. It is pricey and it's also very difficult to get it right because you don't know uh, how all the pieces within the business fit together. However, what we do do is we look at a business and we want to buy a business that has an implicit currency hedge. So if you look at a company like Alker, what happens is they can easily pass any negative impact of depreciation onto the end user. So historically what's happened is, let's say Turkish Lira depreciates by a factor of two, they have not had an issue raising their prices by a factor of two. So as a US dollar based investor, you're not any worse off as a result of that. Because in US dollars, their price remains steady. It changes in local currency, but I suppose it doesn't matter. So their pricing in US dollars has basically remained steady. It's a very general question, not about, more about the business. Because if you take, uh, in our part of the world, a lot of the diabetes problems is coming out of the sugary diet we've been exposed to the last 50 years. And if you go to the World Diabetes Foundation homepage, you can see there's initiatives how to change the uh, diets in our part of the world. Uh, one of the most exposed diabetic countries in the world is Saudi Arabia, so mm -hmm. it's not that far and probably part of that market. So in your risk assessment, how did you, kind of, if you looked at it, how did you kind of assess that this business could be going away within the next 30 years? Um, well, so basically what you're saying is that in our part of the world has been a big push to get rid of candy and stuff like that. Well, if you look at uh, Kraft or Mars or Wrigley, well, it's not like they went away because there's a big push, right? If you look at, uh, so why would Turkey be different from the U.S., for example, when it comes to uh, uh, confectionery products? Because because of that push for lower sugar, we don't see Wrigley going bankrupt or we don't see Kraft going bank bankrupt or Mondelez, right? Like they're still growing their units. Uh, so uh, again, like with Ulker, it's probably gonna be a very similar dynamic. I don't see why it, it should be different. Maybe you come up with low sugar products. Maybe you come up with stuff that's healthier. I think you've seen it with perhaps Mars and uh, and Cadbury, et cetera. But uh, so far, I haven't seen any confectionery companies go out of business in uh, the Western world, despite the push for uh, less sugar in products. Any other questions? <laughs>